If you're here with a party or with a candidate, to be honest, you're really not welcome. I mean, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're here. But we, we know you're the, you're the decided. Um, and I'm going to ask that uh, we don't cheer or clap for crowds. They're going to make great points. They're great people. But um, this is for information. And that's the main goal. And one of these people is going to get in and they're going to do a great job. And out of the 300 in Ottawa now, 297 are fantastic people and work really hard. And they're going to be the same. Um, but we just asked for some decorum. Um, there's only me managing it. I don't have security here today. <laughs> so you're going to have to work with me. And why don't we open with our... Dan, we'll start. Sure. And we'll give you uh, five minutes. And I'll just clear my throat when you're getting close. Great. Subtlety's my strong point. So <laughs> that sounds great. Uh, my name is Dan Meads. I'm the NDP candidate here in Calgary Centre. It's a large room with lots of folks and no mic, so uh, I hope you can all hear me. If not, assume I said exactly what you wanted to hear. <laughs> you know, for the last three and a half years, I've been the director of Vibrant Communities Calgary. We do poverty reduction work at VCC. We work with governments, nonprofits, businesses, and people living in poverty to make our communities stronger better and more fair for everybody. That's part of what led me to run for the NDP, making our communities stronger, better, and more fair for everybody. I'm proud to be a part of a party that is today the official opposition, in fact, the biggest, strongest, and most effective opposition that Stephen Harper has ever seen. You know, there's been lots made of polls in the last week, and I know we're going to talk about it. So I thought I'd tell you what I think right away. In the last federal election, the same company that's done the polls here in the city put out a prediction three days before the general election. And it said in Quebec, the NDP would get one seat. And that one seat would not belong to Tom Mulcair. You know, we got 59 seats in Quebec. And Tom is the leader of the official opposition. And while I strongly dislike quoting conservatives, I will say that Diefenbaker knew what he was talking about when he said only dogs know what to do with polls. <laughs> and so I would ask you today to think about what you would like to vote for, not against. To think about what you want out of your city, not what you're afraid of. And to be aspirational when you cast your ballot on Monday. You know, there, is, there are some of us in this country that feel as though our votes don't count unless we use them strategically. I would say that our votes don't count unless we use them ethically, from our value set. And for those that feel as though their vote hasn't counted in the past, we know the answer to that. It isn't strategic voting. It's voting for a party that is willing to change the electoral system so that your vote will matter every other time. You know, the NDP is the only party in the House of Commons that says we need a conversation about electoral reform and that conversation needs to include proportional representation. That is the way forward from our electoral politics point of view. There has been much made in this campaign about transparency. You know, the federal conservatives ran on transparency. I didn't know they meant that their candidate would be invisible. But for this entire election, we've been looking for Joan, haven't we? And we haven't seen her. The rest of the candidates in this race gave answers to important questions. And so I'm glad Joan is here today, because I have some questions for her. And they don't come from me, they come from Calgarians on the doorsteps every day. Some of you that are in this, in this room. For example, Joan, this is the pie debate, and so obviously the question on everybody's mind is lard or butter. <laughs> also, you skipped the mayor's debate, and so how do you feel about municipal infrastructure? How do you feel about transportation? How do you feel about making our cities stronger? Did you go with pork or beef in your pie? And also, how do you feel about public broadcasting? 
you skip that debate as well. How do you feel about Canadians having a fair press system that we can rely on? And so these are the questions that we should be demanding answers to today. These and many others. How do you feel about the CNUC Nexon deal? Why did your government choose to hide the decision until after the debate, until after the, the by-election? How do you feel about the Northern Gateway Pipeline? 25 seconds left. Yeah. These are the questions we need to demand answers to today. Not in a rude way. Just because we deserve to know. Because as voters, we deserve some respect. You know, the Prime Minister skipped the first minister's meeting this week. The same Prime Minister that was held in contempt of Parliament. Jones said she would do whatever he said. And he said show contempt for the voters of Calgary Centre. And that's what Joan has done. Thank you. Okay. I'm Harvey Locke, and I'm the first Liberal in 40 years to be neck and neck with a Conservative in an election. And this election will be an election about what face this city wants to show Canada. Because the lines are really, really clear. My values are these. I am fiscally prudent, socially progressive, and environmentally responsible at home and abroad. I believe those are interconnected and integrated concepts. And I believe the great challenge of the 21st century is to figure out how we can do that well together. Jonah said this election is about the economy and she will follow the Prime Minister in whatever way he thinks. So you have a big choice. You can pick a local kid who was born here, who grew up here, who's worked all over the world, qui parle français, qui peut hablar espagnol, but who is very much from southern Alberta. I'm a fifth generation southern Albertan. And I have, I have a sixth generation, my nieces who live here, and my nephews. Or you can pick the Rob Anders style of conservative that is a Reform Party conservative, which is Joan. It's your choice. It's a clear choice. Both points of view exist in Calgary. Let's acknowledge that. But I believe in Calgary Centre that we are progressive people. That the majority of people in Calgary Centre share those values of being fiscally prudent socially progressive and environmentally responsible at home and abroad. And I believe that Alberta wants to turn its face to the future, not the conflicts of the past. And yes, I know the Liberal Party has not had its relationship with Calgary right <coughs> over the last 40 years, but this is a chance to get it right. And during this election, you have seen elected member of parliament after elected member of parliament all the way from the Atlantic to British Columbia come here and say, Please, Calgary, join us in building a progressive alternative, an entrepreneurial progressive alternative with your point of view as entrepreneurial people. And we know when you're an entrepreneur from Calgary, you're not just about making money. We know that you know how to be entrepreneurial on social matters. And we know you know how to be entrepreneurial on environmental matters. Please bring that energy into the fold of Progressive Canada and give us a chance to build a national team of people to contest the 2015 election on clear lines that are different than the Conservatives, but are not the angry Dutch disease angle of the NDP. Prime Minister, former Prime Minister Paul Martin was here yesterday talking about what it means to be fiscally prudent. It means you actually pay your bills as they come due, and it means you don't hand a deficit off to future generations. And former Finance Minister Ralph Goodale was here yesterday talking about how we stabilized the Canada Pension Plan and I have made a rock-hard commitment to every young person in this city that the Canada Pension Plan will be there for you as it is for me, as it is for my parents, because it's only fair. And we need to be intergenerationally fair. These are the values that I have. I believe these are the values that Liberals have all over Canada, and I know they do because I've worked with them all over the country. And I believe that these are deeply Albertan values. These are deeply Calgary Centre values. I was born here. I grew up here. I went to school here. I practiced law downtown here for 14 years. I've worked here. I started out as the chairman of the Calgary Banff chapter of the Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society. 
and was, became the national president of CFAWS. I have worked all over Canada. I have worked in Parliament. I have negotiated bills with, with governments and Parliament. I have worked with, on a consensus basis, the uh, Conservative minority government, the Liberal opposition, and the NDP opposition to get the Nahani National Park Act bill through in record time. We worked cooperatively and together. That's Canada. We have a Prime Minister who ignores meetings that involve the other provinces. How can you govern a federation if you don't talk to people? We have a Prime Minister who snubbed the city of Calgary on Sunday. This P3 scandal that was raised by Bob Ray in Tuesday in the House of Commons on behalf of Calgary because there was recreation center funding eligible to the tune of $100 million, the Prime Minister snubbed the city and said, no, we don't fund rec centers and retroactively changed the criteria that did include rec centers. Bob Ray raised that question in the House of Commons Tuesday. Do you know what was the response from the members of Parliament from Calgary? Oh, I'm glad you've discovered Calgary. Ho, ho, ho. No answer on substance. Then Bob Ray went back and said, well, you give the city of Calgary the three and a half million dollars that they spend on your process back at the very least. Ho, 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 I'm glad the official opposition has finally figured out that there's a Calgary. But we're better than that. We are better than that in Calgary. We are capable of intelligent thought. We are capable of intelligent debate. And we need different ideas coming from our city than just whatever Stephen Harper thinks. Please elect me on Monday. We'll make history together. Thank you. I think we're going to have a, a mic after the break. So I don't know if you need one though, Harvey. Joan, you're next. Hi folks, and thanks very much everyone for coming today. I think the debate today, is this turnout is a great sign. And um, you know, one of the things, the reason why I'm here today, and by the way, I was at the debate last Saturday. You don't often hear about the debates the candidates are at, but I'm here to, to earn your vote. And I have been out earning your votes for the last four and a half months, knocking on doors, because I actually respect voters. And I think you have to go to voters' doors and meet them where they live and ask them what their issues are if you expect to be able to represent them. How else would you know to be a good MP? What, are, what your issues are? So I've been there knocking on doors. I, we've knocked on over 15,000 doors now in Calgary Centre. And I suspect that there are many of you here who have met me or other members who are outdoor knocking with me. And that's not other teams of campaigners. That's me personally at the doors because I respect Calgarians and I want to hear what they have to say. <coughs> now I'm going to tell you a couple things about myself, a bit about opportunity, a couple of things about threats, and then what you can do. So a bit about myself is I actually do live in the riding now. Not in the past, but right now. I've raised my family here. We've lived here for 17 years. Our kids went to school here. I volunteered for the same charities that you volunteer for. I participated in the arts. I've gone to Theatre Calgary. I raised $200,000 for the Alberta College of Art and Design student scholarships. That shows commitment to community, and that's what we do here, right? That's how we've built this great community of Calgary, because we're all engaged, and we all participate in it. And I've worked at the Calgary Herald as a managing editor and as a journalist covering the issues every day that matter to Calgarians for 17 years. And as a political commentator on TV, standing up for you, standing up for our values, standing up for our principles, standing up for our innovative entrepreneurial city that is leading Canada, the cultural capital of, of the country this year, as well as the capital that's driving the economy. So to talk about opportunity, why did we come here? <coughs> How many of you were actually born here? Harvey gets to put his hand up now. <laughs> so we've got a good sampling of people that were actually born here. And the rest of us have all come here. Why have we come here? Because it's a city of opportunity. This is an entrepreneurial city that looks forward, that innovates. And we want to keep that happening. And right now, we have the best economy in the world in, in Canada. Um, and it's the best economy of the G7 countries. And we know that's not by accident. When we see that Greece and Italy and Spain and Portugal, the EU is back in recession. Japan, the world's third largest economy, went back into recession last week. We see the US is facing a fiscal cliff. We realize how precious it is 
that Canada has been able to keep its economy growing because that's what contributes to our quality of life. That's what pays for our important social programs, like programs for health care and seniors. If we don't have a healthy economy, folks, all the spending in the world that the opposition parties can promise you will never come to fruition because we need an economy to keep our quality of life high. So what's the threat? Well, the threat is that the opposition parties, they all want to shut our energy industry down. They all have various <laughs> ways. <laughs> they all have various ways of doing it. We know Justin Trudeau said he's in favor of the CNOC deal, but you know what? He's against the gateway pipeline. So if the CNOC deal went through, how would you get that oil to market? And the Liberal Party is against West Coast tanker traffic. So you certainly couldn't ship it offshore to India and China and the new markets that we need access to if we want world prices for our uh, products in Calgary and in Alberta. This is what's been keeping our economy going. The NDP, we know Mr. Mulcair has been saying that our industry is a disease. And as to the Green Party, of course, all three of these parties are in favor of a carbon tax, which the, Green Part, which the NDP values on its books at $20.1 billion. That's money that would come directly out of our economy. It's right there in the platform. So we need, we need to elect someone that will stand for us in Calgary, someone that will stand for our values, someone that will keep seconds. our economy growing, and someone that stands for the principles that you stand for and the values that we all stand for. And I ask you on Monday to please cast your vote for optimism and growth and keeping the things that have made Calgary strong, vote conservative. Thank you. On time, Joan. Very good. So the gentleman that uh, said not true, please stand up. Right here. Okay, listen. You want to have a debate, you get your own community hall and come out. Otherwise, I'm going to ask you to leave. Please be quiet. We don't have a lot of time here. We can't have hecklers in the crowds. You're welcome to go. There you go. All right. All right, anyone else? Anyone else? Okay. It's just me here. Just <laughs> yeah, you can come up here if you want. Good evening, folks. My name is Chris Turner, and I am the candidate for the Green Party of Canada here in Calgary Centre. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about how I came to be that candidate, and then a little bit about why it matters, and then a whole lot about why your vote matters. So to begin with, uh, I'm an author and journalist. I've written uh, three books, uh, one of them about the Simpsons TV show, so we can trade trivia later if anyone wants to, uh, and the other two about sustainability and energy issues and building livable cities. And the journey that kind of finished here, asking for your vote, began when I took those subjects on as the core focus of my work as a journalist and writer. Uh, my daughter had just been born, uh, seven years ago now, and I knew that I needed to find a way to talk about this uh, uh, set of challenges we saw emerging around climate change and energy and stewardship of the environment. We had to figure out a way to talk about that stuff that was not fearful, that was not despairing, that had hope and optimism and a future worth fighting for and worth pursuing at its core. And I didn't quite know what that would look like, but what I quickly found was an extraordinary emerging new economy and new way of doing business and new way of, do, uh, of living that maintained continuity with the world we know now, but moved to a place that not only met these challenges, but improved upon so much of what we do today. And I thought, my God, this is an amazing story. People need to hear this story. This is really, I'm a, I'm a storyteller. I see something great happening. I want to tell you about it and tell you, hey, I think we should do more of this. And that's really been the core of my work. And I've written two books on that subject, and I made a commitment to myself as I was writing it because it was so important that on this subject alone, you know, if you give me a megaphone, I'll shout into it. You put me on a soapbox, I'll explain to people what I think, I, what I think is happening and where I think we should be going. 
And I you know, started getting invited to speak a lot of places ac around this city and across the country on this topic. And I found when you talk about hope and optimism and sustainability and livable cities and a diversified energy economy, suddenly just about everyone is willing to come into the room and hear you speak. Yes, I've spoken to environmental groups and Green Calgary and th these sorts of people, the Friends of Fish Creek Park. But I've also spoken to the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers. I've also spoken to the Alberta Institute of Agrologists, which is mostly oil guys these days. And the reason is because we all know where we need to go. We all know that we need to begin to make some serious changes if our children and grandchildren are going to have a sustainable future. And so that's why I, I, I was willing to stand up on those soapboxes. And this summer, Elizabeth May, who by the way was recently named Parliamentarian of the Year, Elizabeth May came to me and asked, would you be willing to run in Calgary Center? Is this a thing you'd like to do? And there weren't many people, there's only one person actually who I would answer yes to, I think, on that question. It's Elizabeth May because of her inspirational leadership since she became the first Green Party member in Canadian history. She works across party lines. She's the one, when everyone else was ready to just let that omnibus budget bill slide by, who said, wait a minute, and wrote 300 amendments from her single office, from her one seat, so that that bill, yes, it was going to pass. Yes, the conservative government that Joan Crockett would like to join wanted to hide a rewriting of the Fisheries Act and all kinds of environmental protection scale back in that bill. But Elizabeth May said, my one seat is powerful enough to get a good look at this thing at least. And they did. And we had a 22-hour debate about it. And the Canadians realized that is not what should be in a budget bill. Those things should not be, not be cut. And that was the moment where I decided, yes, I will stand with Elizabeth and I will run for parliament. And what I'd like to do is start to change a few critical conversations. This is something I had a little bit of experience with here in Calgary. Uh, a few years back, knowing what I knew about sustainability and how much cities were critical to that conversation, I joined a number of other committed people across the city, formed an organization called Civic Camp to try and get Calgarians a real voice at City Hall. One of the co-founders of that organization is now our mayor, Nahid Nenshi. We did change that conversation. Now we need to take it to Parliament. We need real voices in Parliament that respect the democracy and respect the institution <coughs> of Parliament seconds. itself and are willing to use the seat to represent their constituents first. This is so important in this by-election. I agree with Harvey, well, you do only have two choices in this election. You have a backbencher for one of three parties who believe Parliament is a place to shout in, or you can have the second Green Party MP in Canadian history who will be free when I get there, not to read off a piece of paper what my talking points are, not to vote the way the agenda's already been determined, but to continue to advocate there for the things I'm talking to you about right here. We have an am amazing opportunity. This is not about jockeying for position in 2015. This is about what Calgary needs right now. And what Calgary needs right now is to send the loudest, clearest message it could possibly send by sending the second Green MP in Canadian history to Parliament. Thanks. 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 Right. Okay, come on, come on, we're never going to get to the meat pie. Calgary Centre, what are its needs? I think Calgary Centre needs to share with the rest of the country the true face of Calgary. That we are a cosmopolitan and diverse city that we are capable of uh, having more than one point of view in our civic discourse, that we are not all the same, that Rob Andrews style conservatism is not the only kind of thing that we are. And I think that we need to tell the rest of the country we want to engage. And I think we need to tell our parliamentarians that they want Calgary to have a fair shake, that we want Calgary to have a fair shake. You know that we don't get a fair shake on infrastructure funding. Our LRT lines get no federal funding. Ottawa got $600 million in federal funding. Waterloo, Ontario got $300 million in federal funding. Calgary got zilch. In our arts, our arts are not supported by this federal government, our arts and culture, not at all. You know how much money the Glenbow Museum gets from the province? A little over $2 million a year. You know how much it gets from the federal government? Wait for it, zero. Zero. And when I lived in Toronto for a while, I watched the lead federal investments in the Art Gallery of Ontario and the Royal Ontario Museum 
and the, and the new ballet downtown on University Avenue. And when I lived in Montreal for a while, I watched the lead federal investment in the Place des Spectacles, which was a complete renovation of an eastern area of uh, downtown Montreal into a glorious, beautiful, <coughs> integrated urban design place. Calgary, zero. Remember that, zero. We need to do better than this. We need more voices from Calgary. We can't just be in the chorus line in Ottawa. That's great. So, from, th from this point forward, I'll get you to just to hold your applause, folks. I mean, try. Do your best. <laughs> okay, uh, Joan. <laughs> I think facts are always helpful to the conversation. And I think what Calgary needs is, it needs a government that will stand up for it and make us proud. Calgarians are proud of what we've been contributing to the country. And we shouldn't be embarrassed or ashamed. We're the ones who are the economic drivers right now that are paying a lot of the bills for all of Canada. And we are developing our resource sustainably. Canada has some of the best environmental standards in the world. We continue to improve them. We're on a positive mm -hmm. track. And you know what? It's because this, this province is doing so well and our energy industry is doing so well that Canada right now is not slipping into recession like a lot of the other countries. We know that we're contributors. We know that we, uh, we can be relied on, but we want to make sure that we have a parliamentarians that will stand up for what we're contributing and make sure that the rest of the, the country knows that we are positive contributors. So that's very important, and I think I also want to address Harvey Locke's statement that uh, we don't contribute. The federal government, our conservative government, does not contribute to Calgary. It's rail, it's arts, for example. There's been $51 million the conservative government's put into public transit improvements. Twelve million into light rail transit improvements, a hundred million into the ring road, upgrades to Canada Olympic Park, forty million. Want to talk about arts? How about the National Music Center, twenty-five million dollars? Mount Royal University for the performance hall and conservatory, twenty million. You know the new exhibit hall at Stampede Park, twenty-five million. There are all kinds of things that the federal government is doing for Calgary. Be assured, the biggest thing that the federal government is doing for Calgary is standing up for it on the national stage. We have a Calgarian as the Prime Minister and we are proud of that. We're proud of how you guys are contributing and you need an MP who's going to stand up for you in Ottawa. I know it's hard. Chris? You know, I, I do very much enjoy listening to Joan Crockett brag in numbers because they are remarkable numbers. 12 million in transit. I'd like to put that in context for you. That is less than half the, the, the federal government spent grandstanding about the War of 1812 this year. <laughs> so that's how important transit is to this government. It's less than half as important as celebrating the War of 1812, which, while a great war and all, ended 200 years ago. <laughs> Calgary needs a voice in Parliament now. It needs a new voice. And the first thing I will say is the thing I've been saying this entire campaign, which is that we need a real partner that understands cities in Ottawa. I launched my campaign two months ago on the C train to make a point, which is that, Cal that, that this government is not properly funding urban infrastructure. We talk about Calgary being the economic engine of the country, and I agree, but that's not just because we have energy resources. That's because this is a great city that people want to settle in and live in and make businesses in. And we won't be able to continue to capture and retain that top talent if we are not investing in infrastructure like transit, like the rec centers that this government failed to properly fund after promising the money. All kinds of stuff that we are sitting here waiting, begging for. Really what we need is a new deal for cities. And I think what we need is a voice from Calgary that can make that argument to say, you know what? We know you think you can take the votes in Calgary for granted, but I'm here to tell you that's not the case. It is time to step up and really fund cities properly. And I can promise you when I get to Ottawa, I will still be talking about exactly what I'm talking about here right now. Thanks. There is this notion that Calgary is somehow different from the rest of the country. This notion that somehow Calgary as a city is different fundamentally. And that the people of Calgary, well, we're fundamentally different as well. I want to be clear with you when I say that I do not believe that that attitude helps us at all. 
I think Calgary needs to stand up and say, hey, we are part of the national discourse. We are a growing, thriving city, more than a one-horse town. But that doesn't mean Calgary's exceptionalism is the story. It means that Calgary's ability to be a functioning part of the rest of the country is the story. And we can do that with help from the federal government. In the work I've done here in poverty reduction, the glaring thing that was missing was support from the federal government. I liked Joan's numbers too, and I liked that she started by saying facts were important. She will no doubt regret that. $37 billion in cuts from health care. That is, unbelievably, even more than Paul Martin cut from health care, which was $11 billion. We all thought that wasn't possible. What Calgary needs is a national transit strategy, a national housing strategy, the Accountability Act that the NDP have proposed. We need a government that isn't currently being taken to court by no less than three separate groups, one being the parliamentary budget officer. We need a government that has never been held in contempt of parliament, but more so, a government that doesn't feel contempt for parliament. What we do not need is a government and a representative from Calgary who says that their raison d'etre will be to do whatever the Prime Minister tells her. We do not need to rebuild a Liberal Party on the backs of Calgarians. We need a choice for a strong opposition, and that opposition is the NDP. Thank you. It's, you know, Parliament is, is tough. What can one person really do? And I think of um, Chuck Cadman. And for those folks that may know him, may not know him, um, there's one guy that had a bit of influence. But really, what can one person do? Joan? I just want to use one minute just to make sure that people are very clear that I've made it clear through my entire campaign that my job is to represent the citizens of Calgary. And that is, my, that is why I'm spending all my time at the doors. And I wanted to address Dan's comment about doing what the Prime Minister thinks and make it clear to you that was in response to a question about whether or not I would be in Cabinet. And that is clearly the Prime Minister's and only the Prime Minister's decision. My job is to represent you as a member of Parliament, to have an office here that you can call, to be there, an open office where you can come in if you have things that are bothering you. You know what? If you're in Mexico and you lose your passport, do you want to call an opposition member of Parliament? Or do you want to call somebody that can walk across to the minister's office and go in and get an answer for you and enable you to get back on the next plane. What I have to offer you is the chance to have a seat at the table and that's what one person can do in Ottawa and here they can listen to you and I have a history of listening. That's what I've made my career as as a journalist is listening to people and that's why I've been on the doors listening to you and you know what you've told me at the doors overwhelmingly that what matters to you is keeping a positive economy growing that supports our quality of life. That's what you've asked us to do as a government. That's what the Conservative Party is doing. And I will speak out for you for our sustainable, responsible energy development. And that's a message that we need to get out across all of Canada because there are a lot of myths that are being circulated here and other places about our energy development. We are proud of it. We have the, some of the best environmental standards. The Curl Oil Sands plant opening in Fort McMurray any day now will have the same greenhouse gas emission per barrel of oil produced as a conventional refinery in the U.S. That's the kind of improvement that we're seeing <laughs> and we need to tell that story. I will tell that story for you. What can one MP do? This is a question uh, that comes up a lot, particularly in a by-election. What can one MP do? If you're, you have the 164th yay vote on a conservative bill, the 101st member of the, or 104th member of the official opposition, or the 36th member of, of the Liberal Party, what are you going to do? You're going to sit down on the back bench and find out what the agenda is, and that's how you are going to serve Calgarians. But people have always said, don't throw your vote away on any other party but these three. Uh, finally, they were willing to, to, to give it a try uh, out on the West Coast, and what they got 
was the Parliamentarian of the Year. They got the most effective voice in Parliament because it was finally free <laughs> of the divisive uh, uh, name-calling rhetoric that currently dominates Parliament. So that's the voice you get. More than that, you get a voice for Calgary that is credible. I, I, will, I will agree with Joan wholeheartedly. I think there are people in the oil and gas sector here in Calgary who are doing fantastic work on environmental stewardship, who are deeply committed to reducing ga greenhouse gas emissions. Part of the reason why, when you go into uh, uh, certain sorts of forums where this is being discussed that aren't being led by the government, no one believes you, is because our government is not credible on these topics anymore. What we need is a Green MP from Calgary who knows how to talk to both sides of the aisle, who has credibility with industry and critics, who has credibility with colleagues around the world who represent the Green Party in other parliaments. You've got three years till the next general election. Don't vote on who you want to be the government then. Vote for someone to represent you right now. I'm the only one who can promise you that my voice will be my own when I get to parliament. What can one person do? Well, I suppose it depends on the person, doesn't it? Tommy Douglas gave us health care and made our country better. Ed Broadbent started a war against child poverty and made our country better. Jack Layton strengthened our cities and made our country better. Those men led with their values. And they led with a team behind them that understood their values and knew that we could make this country better. So what can one person do? I think you know the answer. Can make this country better. That's what I'm asking you to help me do. You know, we have 100 NDP members of Parliament right now. That's the most we've ever had. It's the biggest opposition Stephen Harper's ever had. One person can do a lot. One person as a member of a hundred person team that share a value set, that share some common goals. Well, now we're really talking, aren't we? Now we can really change the world. And if you look at what the NDP has said, what our vision is for the future of Canada, it is a stronger, better, more fair country. We have 3.2 million Canadians living in poverty today. One in five children go to school hungry every day. 20 seconds. What can one person do as a member of a value-driven team? We can make our country better. All right. And that's hard. Politics is not an individual sport, it's a team sport. And one person needs to understand that you have to work with other people if you want to get anything done in the Parliament of Canada. I have been able to work with parliamentarians out of every party to get something done in the Parliament of Canada because I understand that this country is different and diverse and there is no place for people from Calgary to go to Ottawa and tell people what to do. It doesn't work and it's not welcome. It's not welcome in anyone's life to be told what to do, is it? We need to go from Calgary to Ottawa with a progressive face, not just a conservative face. I acknowledge there are conservative voices in Calgary, but this city is more diverse than that. So if you send me to Ottawa, you will send someone with clear values of being fiscally prudent, socially progressive, and environmentally responsible at home and abroad, with a commitment to work with other people from across Canada to restore the progressive nature of Canada's basic being. And I will work with people from Quebec because I can speak French, and I will work from people from British Columbia because I've done a lot of work there, and I will work with people from Ontario and from the North because I've spent mm -hmm. a lot of time there and in the Maritimes too, because this is the Federal Parliament of Canada. We are not running for aldermen, we are not running for individual of the year, we are running to make a contribution to the governance of Canada with a unique perspective from Calgary. I call that perspective the perspective of the entrepreneurial progressive. And during the course of this election, you will have seen liberal elected person after liberal elected person come to this city, stand in my office in front of the TV cameras and the press and say, 
Please, Calgary, send a progressive with your unique perspective to Ottawa. We welcome it. We want it. Help us build an alternative for 2015 so the choice isn't Thomas Mulcair and Stephen Harper, but somebody who's not angry at the country, but who's eager to work with other people and build the great Canada that we grew up in and that we love. That's yeah. what I'll do. Do I get it now? Yeah, you can have it now. Awesome. You only have a minute, though. I have a minute to rebut, so I will speak quickly. <laughs> Harvey says he has brought liberals here to tell us what they think of Calgary. And when they're here, I like what they say. <laughs> when they aren't here, however, what they say about Calgary is pretty troubling stuff. <laughs> and when Harvey tells me that Thomas Mulcair is angry, I think that's interesting because the people of Calgary are angry at the Liberal Party of Canada. Because of the dismissive way we are treated, it is classic liberal arrogance to stand up here and say we love Calgary and we've come from all over to help. And then to get on a plane and go back out east and say, Alberta MPs, go back home. And so do not listen to the Liberal Party when they tell you that Thomas Mulcair is angry and that the Liberal Party loves Calgary. It is reductionist thinking in the worst sort. Thank you. Any more rebuttals? Next question? Oh, you did? I didn't see. Yeah. I want to speak to this. Oh, let me start the timer. <laughs> <laughs> Not so fast. All right, go ahead. Okay. What's being referred to is a two-year-old comment by Justin Trudeau on TV that was badly translated, for which he apologized to every person in Calgary. That's what happened. Now, I want to ask you this. Stephen Harper said we should build a firewall around Alberta, and there's a culture of defeat in the Maritimes but he became Prime Minister of Canada. Has anybody in this room ever disparaged Edmonton? <laughs> no, never, not a Calgarian, no, I wouldn't do that. We have to grow up here, digging out an interview two and a half years ago and saying, see that shows you that liberals hate Calgarians. When you have a native son of Calgary, a sixth generation Southern Albertan running, and you've had elected person after elected person come here and say, Please, Calgary, join us. We want your point of view. Are you going to pick the scabs of the past and focus on everything that's negative in life, or are you going to say this election? And what we're trying to do is build a future together. Let's move on. Let's focus on Canada. That's what I want to do. I don't want to pick scabs. I want to build a great country. And I know that my fellow Liberals want me there from Calgary as a Calgarian to do that. And I hope you'll send me there to do it. Thank you. Yeah. Oops, I got, how did I get three sticks? I, I, I put one in there. Oh, you got a stick in the mix too. Okay. Yeah. You're going to burn out my one minute timer here, guys. I know. Jeez. Take it away. You got one minute. All right. I just want to speak briefly to the amount of divisive uh, rhetoric we've heard about Calgary and about Alberta this week. Because I think it does in fact cut to the core of what's wrong with Parliament today. It is not anymore about coming together to govern the country. It is about scoring political points off of each other, shouting back and forth, turning the conversation, the most important conversation we need to be having about our energy future, into a shouting match containing a whole bunch of buzzwords that just get you know, sort of barked back and forth. Exactly. And that's why this is a great opportunity for Calgary to say, hey, wait a minute, we're smarter than this. We want a real voice for Calgary. We don't want someone angling for position in the shouting match of 2015. We want a real representative for this city right now. Again, I'm the only one who can promise you that. Thank you. And Joan, did you have a rebuttal in there? You're going to say it. You no. want to stick in the mix? Enough too, said. Joan? Enough said, okay. What is the top priority for Canadians today? You're interested in answering the question, put a check mark on it. Oh, well, that's Chris. Chris the check mark. Mark. No, no, they oh. go down and we'll count the check marks. Whichever gets the most check I, I assume. Yeah, I'm not claiming. We're question. confused. Or at least I'm confused. Yeah. 
these are the, these come from the floor. Gotcha. But how do we? Just pausing my time. <laughs> Break if you like. Yeah, I just. I, don't know. Yeah, I think that would be a little better. That's a good idea. Give them back, Dan. Sure. <laughs> I've already written my own and slipped them in. <laughs> All right, we'll start you from the top again, Chris. All right. Go ahead. Sorry for that. So, which is the, what is the most important question? No, top priority. Top priority. I can speak to this by election. I can speak to the top priority for Calgarians. I think it's the same thing that is, you know, sort of the, the uh, uh, official local sport whenever the Stamps and the uh, uh, Flames aren't playing, which is uh, energy. Uh, what we're going to do with our, our resources today and where we're heading in the future. And to have this conversation, you have to do more than pick a phrase or two and shout it across the aisle in Parliament. You have to do more than cheerlead or boo hiss. You actually have to bring people together and have a grown-up conversation about where we need to go. The industry does not need cheerleaders. The industry needs real leadership and regulatory certainty so that it can carry on. It needs real definitions. Joan loves to talk about sustainable, responsible resource development while never defining what sustainable or responsible means. This is really where we are now, project to project with no clarity and no coherence because there is no leadership. So what we need is someone who, not in 2015, but right now, can change that conversation. The green guy from Calgary can change that conversation. I can speak to both sides of the aisle. I would love to join with the Premier and the Premiers of all the provinces and all the other stakeholders, including industry here in Calgary, in a real conversation about our energy future so that we can get the regulatory certainty we need and that when we're having that discussion, we are also talking about the low carbon future we know we need to get to and how to have entrepreneurs here in Calgary and across the country involved in building the green economy we need. That's the most important issue we need to be asking ourselves. Who can speak to what we need right now? And Ben. The most important question in Canada right now is what are they hiding? It's what are they hiding? What are they hiding inside their 400 page omnibus bills? What are they hiding about Scenic and Nexon when they won't come to a decision until after a by-election right here where there are thousands of jobs at stake? What are they hiding when they strip away environmental protections at, at the, the stroke of midnight on a Friday night? When they send out press releases about important decisions in the middle of the night on Friday? What are they hiding when they don't let their candidate come out and speak to Calgarians? There is only one party that is able to ask that question, what are they hiding? You know, the NDP gets 130 questions a week in question period. And with some of them, we can ask, what are they hiding? We can ask about oil sands development. We can ask about electoral reform. We can ask what's important to Canadians. We can ask why the government feels it's okay to be brought to court by the parliamentary budget officer. Because all of that is what are they hiding? You know, I like Chris's point about being the second Green Party MP. However, there is something important to remember. The Green Party gets one question per week. The NDP gets 130 questions per week. And so we are the only chance of Canadians really understanding what the federal conservatives are hiding. Thank you. I think the most important question is how do we move beyond an obsession with the economy to talk about how things come together in society. Of course we need a strong economy, but an economy is there to serve society and culture, not the other way around. And society and culture live within the context of the natural environment. And we need to confront and embrace these realities. The oil sands is one of the greatest sources of wealth on Earth. I've worked all over the world, and I know of no country that would not develop that if it had the ability to mobilize the capital and the expertise to do it. And we must honor and confront that it is a large source of environmental impacts. 
So how do we talk about this in an open way? How do we scale up and do some good for the environment while producing the wealth from there? How do we get it to market in a value-added way to Asia, across Canada in either direction? And you do that by talking about values, and you do that through a conversation. You don't do it by telling people. You know what? We've tried to tell people we want pipelines out of Alberta, and guess what? They're not getting built, are they? You can't tell your neighbors what to do when the pipeline crosses the neighbor's yard. It's really very straightforward. You can't tell people what, that you're looking after the environment when you dismantle the environmental laws of the country in an omnibus bill in May and another omnibus bill in October. It's not credible, it's not sensible, and it damages our prosperity. It's time we acted like the integrated people all humans are, that we had a public policy that more resembled that of the 1970s in Alberta, where we had open conversations about adding value, acting like an owner, protecting the environment, doing planning, investing in the arts. That's the Canada I want. That's the Calgary I want. And we have a chance to pull forward on Monday. Thank you. So I've already talked about the economy and we all know that the economy is the issue because the economy is what gives us opportunity. It keeps our kids at home. So they don't have to travel and move away to get jobs in other places. It gives us the opportunity to fund education, health care, our social programs. The Conservative government gave them the largest increase in the guaranteed income supplement for poor seniors that's been given in 25 years. You can't do that if your economy is not growing. So rather than belabor the, uh, the point about the economy, I think we all get it. That's what I've been hearing at the doors every day when I've been out there. Keep that going. The other thing I just wanted to say is that the opposition talks about their ability to ask a question. If you elect a government MP, the government will be there speaking where the decisions are made. I think we got one rebuttal there. You know, it's disingenuous from this conservative government to act as though they are fair to seniors. It's true, we just heard Joan tell us how great the conservatives are to seniors. Next she'll be telling us how great they are to veterans, or people of color, or people living in poverty, or single moms, or newcomers to Canada. When somebody tells you that this is just about the economy, they are treating you like you are stupid. Because we know better. We know that we are more than our pocketbooks. If we really talk about the debt this government is leaving to Canadians, there is an economic debt. There is also an environmental debt. And there is also a social debt. And so when somebody tells you you are nothing more than your pocketbook, you should let yourself feel how you want to feel, and that's insulted. Because it is insulting. Thank you. Hey, so Canada's reputation as an impartial broker on international issues has suffered. What would candidates do to change or repair that? And we'll, we'll start with Dan. Well, we know why our international reputation has suffered. We know it's because we've transitioned from peacemaking and peacekeeping to putting in our lot with bullies and traveling around the world in offensives and wars that we shouldn't be a part of. The NDP has been very clear on that. Very clear on how we send our sons and daughters into battle. What the conditions for that sort of decision making would be. You know, interestingly, the Conservative government hasn't just made terrible mistakes as it relates to foreign relations externally, but on military issues inside the country. You know, for the amount that we're spending on jet planes, one would hope they came with engines. <laughs> And it's that type of poor decision making that has caused us to lose our reputation on the international stage. The other thing that we need to keep in mind is our commitment to foreign aid. Under the Harper Conservatives, 
Canada has missed commitments each and every year about our foreign aid around the world. And that's in part why our reputation suffers. You know, I, I lived and worked in West Africa for a long time, and I did so with a Canadian flag on my back. And people would stop me all the time to tell me how amazing Canada was. I fear that that doesn't happen anymore. I still travel a lot. I still wear a Canadian flag on my backpack. But people confuse me with an American now. And I think we can all agree, while our neighbors to the south have many virtues, being confused with them internationally is not something we want to do. And if we are going to be tied to them, perhaps calling them basket cases isn't great foreign affairs either. Thank you. All right. Harvey? <clears throat> you know, our country's come to an interesting place. We, uh, when I was a kid, we were a small country, 20 million people, you'll remember the song. And we were sort of part of the British Empire, Commonwealth of Nations textbooks. Do you remember all that, people my age? And then we were kind of in the sphere of the Americans for a long time. And now all of a sudden, we are kind of an important country in our own right, just as Canada. And that means we need to think about who we are in the world um, in a coherent way. And that's why my campaign is based on the set of values of being fiscally prudent, socially progressive, and environmentally responsible at home and abroad. My campaign has talked about that abroad the whole time. Because if you want to be a successful person or a successful country, you need to behave coherently. And we can't have different interests out of the country than we do in the country. We have to behave consistently. And I'm really glad that Joan has been so clear about the economy being the center of everything. Because our foreign policy is also drifting into the economy being the center of everything. You'll know that our foreign aid is going to shift to being focused on making more money. Well, I view it differently. I view being socially progressive abroad means that we do something more like cooperation rather than foreign aid. And when you do cooperation abroad, you're not looking just to make money, although that could be a byproduct. You're actually looking to help other countries meet their development needs so the world can be a better place. And we want to behave sustainably abroad too. And we don't need to be looking for the next war all the time. We need to be looking about how we can make the world a better place. Our immigration policy needs to reflect that too. We need to understand how other cultures work so that we can embrace them and build a country that's outwardly looking and not afraid. Thank you. And Joan. Our Prime Minister was named World Statesman of the Year this year. That would appear to be it. Can we ask by who? Can we ask by who? Oh, uh, who is that by, Joan? Um, you know the group at all? Come on, please. Some of the United Nations, maybe? That's the only I'll answer, and we I'll don't have the group? Okay. I can Google it while we're uh, there. Hey, Chris. Uh, I grew up on military bases uh, across Canada and around the world. And I think it makes you a bit of a natural diplomat because you're constantly changing your context, constantly having to figure out a new set of rules and see things from other people's point of view. Uh, I lived across Canada. I spent three years in the United States, lived in Germany for a number of years. Uh, speaking to the issue of Canada but having a wonderful reputation abroad, I was once personally thanked on an American military base in Germany for Canada's role in getting hostages out of Iran. And that's a great feeling when you're being thanked for something so noble and, 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 and it's such a heartfelt thanks. I also lived for a year uh, with my my wife in India and uh, and we got to know what what it's like you know to see a, a civilization where you know the whole civilization is built on very different foundations from your own and you really learn you know which of your biases are are, are the most glaring and which ones uh, are, are worth hanging on to and I think this will make me an excellent 
ambassador for Calgary and Canada in the world, because let's be honest about why our international reputation is not what it once was, and that is because we have snubbed the world on climate change. We have told the world we are not interested in your conversation. The government Joan Crockett would like to join has told the world we don't even think that the entire process is valid, we barely acknowledge the problem, we spend nothing on it, and we're doing nothing serious to address it. A Green MP from Calgary can fundamentally change that conversation. A Green MP from Calgary is immediately interesting internationally, with doors open internationally. There will be opportunities for Calgarians to tell the world, hey, you know what? Stephen Harper and his climate change uh, foot draggers do not speak for all of us. We are interested in being part of this conversation, restoring Canada's reputation internationally, and once again, taking a leadership role on environmental stewardship. Thank you. All right, we, just, we have one rebuttal, so if you'd like to uh, reply to that, Harvey. Well, I think it's just important for us to know how the international sphere works. I've done a lot of work internationally. I've met with the President of Europe to discuss uh, the potential for a hydrogen economy. I opened an event in Mexico with the President of Mexico. And just being elected as an MP from Calgary doesn't give you access to world leaders. Canada has a diplomatic corps. The people who have access are frankly through the diplomatic corps. And we need to be real about what our expectations are. That's why I talk about team play and working together to form a government, because that's actually how things do work out there. Thank you. I, I have Googled the answer to the oh, question, by the way. <laughs> so it, it was the New York uh, Appeal of Conscience Foundation, which uh, campaigns for religious freedom and human rights around the globe. Okay, I know the candidates have other engagements, and I, I know some of you would probably like to um, maul and press the flush a little bit here. Chris, you're up first for two minutes for close. What I would like to talk to you about is your vote on Monday. I'm asking for it. We all are. What does that vote mean? All of us are asking you, what does that vote mean? For Joan Crockett, Dan Meads, that vote means one more seat in the backbench on the yay or the nay vote. One more seat in the government, one more seat in the official opposition. For Harvey Locke, that vote means a toehold for the Liberals in Calgary and in Alberta. I'm not running to get a toehold in Calgary for some national party. I'm running to represent Calgary in Parliament. That's what your vote means. Who do you want to represent you in Parliament? Which candidate can you count on to put Calgarians ahead of party politics when they get to Ottawa? There's been a lot of talk particularly in the last few days, about polls and vote splitting and the horse race. And I understand this. Everyone's concerned. Everyone wants their vote to count. But, you know, we can't settle the party politics stuff in one by-election. All we can talk about is which candidate you want to represent you in Parliament, which voice you think can speak to what Calgary needs now from Ottawa, not what 2015 should look like for one of the other three parties. I'd like to finish by telling you how important your vote is because we lose sight of it. My campaign has attracted an extraordinary array of volunteers, including one man who came, you know, no, no, none of us had met him before, his name's Ben. Ben grew up and until very recently lived in Kazakhstan, which is a one-party dictatorship where he had never had a real vote. And he looked at all of the party platforms, what all the candidates were saying, and he said, I want to help you. And so Ben's been in my office making phone calls, asking Calgarians what they want out of their next MP. When you think about vote splitting, when you think about what the polls say, ask yourself, does his vote count? Because it does, and so does yours. And to make it count the most, you will send the second Green Party MP in Canadian history to Parliament. Thank you. Next up is Joan. The reason why I've knocked on 15,000 doors in this election campaign is because I am prepared to work to earn your vote. I am prepared to, for you to be my boss and to answer to you and to be on your doorstep to hear what your concerns are and to make my office open to you and to respond to you. That's been my record as a journalist and that would be my record as an MP. 
And you know, in all my time as a journalist, there was one story that dominated all over other stories that we, I covered pretty much from when I was a cub reporter. You know what that story was? It was the West wants in. It was because the West felt that it never had a voice in Ottawa. That we were, we were always having to constantly fight the anti-West rhetoric that we've seen arise again this week in Alberta. And I don't have to repeat it, it speaks for itself. And you know what, in 2006, we got in. And now we have a majority conservative government. And you know who it represents, guys? It represents us. And that's a tremendous victory for Calgary, for Alberta, for the West, and for every one of you. And that's why today we can be proud of what we're growing in, in Canada and in Alberta and in Calgary. We can be proud of being the cultural capital of Canada in addition to the capital in Canada where our Prime Minister comes from. The reason why we're supporting conservative government policies is because they represent what we think. They represent our values and on Monday, please remember that and come out and vote for the party that represents you, the Conservative Party of Canada. And Harvey. I think Joan put it really well. On Monday you're gonna make a decision. And the reason my friends talk about the polls is because the polls show that Joan and I are neck and neck to become the next MP in Calgary. Calgary Centre. And you have the clearest of possible choices. You can vote for someone who says that everything is about the economy and that this government's performance is perfect and it's a perfect reflection of the city of Calgary and that's who you all are, so vote Conservative. Or you can vote for a native son who knows his way around the world, who has told you that his values are being fiscally prudent, socially progressive, and environmentally responsible at home and abroad, and that he believes, as a kid who grew up here, from a family that's been here a long time, that that's a better reflection of who the people of Calgary Centre are than the Rob Anders style of conservatism that is also from Calgary. The choice could not be more clear. It's as stark as it can be. So who are you, Calgary Centre? Are you like that, or are you like this? It's your call. It's clear, and I thank you for making it so clear. That's your choice. I believe you're more like me. If I'm wrong, you'll elect Joan. If I'm right, we'll make history together. I'll be the first member of another party elected out of Calgary in 40 years. And we can build something special with a unique Calgary perspective in Ottawa. And yes, I'm proud that every Liberal in Canada wants me in Ottawa to help build the Liberal Party because this is party politics. That's how government works in Canada. That's a good thing. People have to cooperate to govern Canada. C'est un pays très divers. On n'a pas tous le même point de vue. Il faut accommoder les autres. C'est ça, le Canada. We are a diverse country. We can't just be from Calgary. We must also be from Canada. And we are proud Canadians in Calgary. We make a big contribution, but we can make a progressive contribution too. It's a two-horse race. Please cheer me on to the grandstand so my wagon can cross the finish line first. Thank you. All right, and down to close. In the last federal election, Michael Ignatieff told us we had one choice between a red door and a blue door. You remember that? Which door did Canadians walk through? Which door did Canadians kick Michael Ignatieff through? It is typical liberal arrogance to suggest you only have a choice between liberals and conservatives. Do you remember when the liberals used to call themselves the natural governing party? I haven't heard that in a long time. Maybe they still talk about it, but there's so few in the House of Commons, I just can't hear them. And so when Harvey tells you you don't have a choice, he is not right. You know, I started this today by asking Joan a series of questions about municipal infrastructure, about transit, about the CBC, about CNOC and Nexon, about pipelines. And we have gotten answers to none of them. Not a single one of them has Joan addressed in the last two hours. She got a question on our reputation internationally, and I guess she had no speaking notes for that, as she only gave us a one-sentence answer. 
And then when we asked her to back it up, she said, Google it. This is what we get from the conservative government. This is what we get from the conservative government's representative in this election. Google it. Seriously. Dan, that no, no, the please, car. Joan, you've had your time. No, you're, Google you're it. You're incorrect, Dan. And so, we have a choice between all of the candidates, Harvey. We can choose to send a member of the official opposition to the House of Commons so that when MPs from Calgary say, Google it, we can say, actually, we know the answer. Actually, we can hold you accountable to it. And so on Monday, I ask for your vote because we can sure do better than not answering questions and telling voters to Google it. All right, just in closing, I'd like to thank the candidates. Um, it is a tough job running. You folks have been on the trail a number of days. You've got a little bit of time to go yet. But uh, my hat's off to all of you. It is not easy to stand up and speak in front of a crowd. I know that. And um, best of luck in Monday's race. And may the best person win. Thank you. Thank you. All the candidates. Yeah, I hope it helps. <laughs>